Hello and welcome back to Advancing with Watercolor. This series deals with some problems that are common in uh, painting watercolors, whether outdoor or in the studio, as well as some solutions. Today the challenge is painting a complex shadows that you uh, see during a oh, summertime when the, when the light is very bright. In fact, today I'm walking through the south end along Boston's southwest corridor. It's a bright sunny day and um, what captures my imagination are the dappled shadows climbing some of the stairways and of these old brownstones. It's uh, visually fascinating and intriguing to me and I'm already thinking about how I can capture uh, some of this shadow stuff. Um, Three things that I'd like to address in this video are how to paint a complex shadow pattern. Shadow pattern. Uh, I'd also like to talk about how to make shadows glow and uh, how to create uh, transparency in shadows. Well, one of the first things, uh, one of the most important things to me is the design. Of course, <clears throat> I start to think about design as soon as I see the scene. I look at my subject from different angles and try to find an interesting pattern of shapes or light and dark qualities um, that I feel that I can use as a foundation for my design. Here you can see the drawing that's resulted in a few observations. And this process sometimes can take quite a bit of time. I need, I need to perhaps see it from different angles, see it from a distance, see it up close before I find a view that strikes me. Or sometimes it's very quick. Sometimes it presents itself immediately. And uh, this is the case today. Um, from prior experience, I know that the shadows will change their character quickly and move uh, to different parts of the building. So I make a sketch uh, indicating the angles that I intend to follow when I'm creating my shadows. But before um, even setting brush to paper, I consider a watercolor plan. Now you can see me working on a, the foundation of the painting, but I'm going to explain to you my watercolor plan in this case. Um, I want to paint the, I've decided to go with a, an underpainting, and that's what I'm working on now. And I'm painting the light hues of yellow ochre, cad red light, alizarin crimson to kind of establish the light hues. And I'm changing them as they go down the page. I'm building in uh, richer colors as they descend in the page. This is to eventually give the effect that light is falling down the side of the building. I'm using a large mop brush and lots of color uh, to trying to create that uh, greater effect of graded effect from top to bottom on the sides of the building, on the doorway, and on the stairway. Um, these are the light colors that I will use, and they will peek through the final uh, application of shadows, uh, resulting in the dappled sunlight effect. Also, these colors will shine through the next layer of paint and give a, uh, the feeling of a glow to the, to the shadows. In the doorway, I'm using a viridian, and I'm trying for the same effect. I'm trying to get a graded effect from a little bit of a lighter version of this viridian to a little darker, even in the short, uh, the short distance that the door presents. Around the door and in through the stairway, I'm using a, a cool gray, and this is made by mixing Viridian and alizarin. So I'm basically using the same uh, color strategy through this painting, which is sort of a red-green uh, complementary hues. Uh, and I believe that this, uh, the selection of these hues and uh, using them in a complementary fashion will give me uh, more, more of a colorful impression in the final painting. Even though I'm going to be following this stage with an application of grade hues and quite dark hues, the lighter colors 
will shine through and their complementary nature will also uh, play off of each other. So to simplify that, uh, the red will amplify the green and the green will be amplified by the red in the final painting. At least that's what I'm hoping for. So you can see I've left some gaps and I've left some um, breaks in the painting, but now as it's drying, as it's starting to dry, you can see the graded effect in the building, a little bit yellower on top, a little bit redder below, and the same is going to be true of the, the doorway. After this dries, my plan is to paint uh, into the shadows, uh, sorry, to paint the shadows themselves with a strong brushwork. Um, I'm going to be paying attention to the angle, the angle of attack, uh, trying to give the illusion that these shadows are descending down the building. And when these shadows hit the ground, uh, that angle will change. So the, the mixture will remain pretty consistent. It will go from a little lighter application up above to a darker application below. But the angle, once it hits the ground level, is going to change uh, so that the openings look a little different. All this is designed to allow me to be expressive with the brush and spontaneous with the brush and at the same time uh, describe the, the surface that these shadows are falling on. And this is important to me, to be able to be spontaneous with the brushwork. I'm trying to think in simple terms, like, uh, like a calligrapher would, how can I get a very simple and, uh, in this case, powerful expression with the brush, and at the same time have it describe uh, the angle that these shadows, I'm sorry, the, the surface that these shadows are falling on, and um, the intensity that these shadows have. So <clears throat> the colors that I'm using here to create the shadows are again a mixture of alizarin crimson, cad red light, and a bit of iridium uh, that went into the underpainting, as well as some neutral tint to gray it a little further and help me with the, the, in, the darker intensity. I would like these shadows to intensify as they move uh, down to the um, first story or even the basement level of the building, building, so that they too followed that graded principle that I used in the underpainting. I believe that the end result of this will um, allow me to, uh, well, help to create the shadows in a more realistic fashion and also more interesting um, fashion. The, the converse of that is to paint the shadows all one color, all one tone, in my estimation, or well, my experience actually, that results in a flatter painting, a painting that's less interesting and um, so less entertaining. And I would like this painting to have that sort of um, immediate feeling as well as a, a sort of vitality expressed through the brushwork and uh, variation as the shadow moves across the building. So those are very much... Those are thoughts that are in my, the forefront of my mind as I'm painting them. Well, the, the gaps that are being left here, you can tell, are, are already starting to have a, a feeling of the surface, uh, a flat surface, a vertical surface, shadows cascading over this vertical surface to help describe uh, the angle of light as well as the surface that they reside on um, as they move towards the stairs and especially as they move towards the ground that angle is going to be varied and will be placed with a little more of a I guess horizontal nature here the angle is a little more vertical and if you notice in the drawing, I placed a few uh, marks to remind myself of the shadows because already, well, 
as I was painting on location, those shadows move very quickly and the temptation is to follow that movement and it can really result in a, a misfire, something that doesn't look good in the end. So I'm almost uh, ignoring the, the shadows as they start to move and paying more attention on those few angled strokes with the pencil that I gave myself um, in the beginning of the drawing. And the, the abstract pattern of these shadows is interesting to me also. So as you noti notice on the doorway, they are describing uh, some of the moldings and, and uh, some of the uh, decorative elements of the door, but they also have a very abstract uh, appeal to me, and I'm trying to maintain that as I paint them. I've switched here to a, a little bit of a smaller brush as I move through this intricate area, sort of my focal center. I'm using a smaller brush to give me detail and to help me to refine some of the smaller passages. And I'll even spend a little more time with, with this passage uh, as I go forward so that I can get clarity in my center of interest. As once I move past that into the stairway and um, lower section of the opposite side, I again move to the big brush and I'm searching for that uh, spontaneous feeling that uh, helps to create a beautiful pattern of shadows. It's um, very close to, to a the way um, performers, musical performers, work with each other when they improvise. I have an understanding in the back of my mind of the sort of quality that I'm searching for. Certainly that light and dark pattern that drops from above and falls across the door is something I want to preserve. That means that I can be rather spontaneous and selective as I'm painting the shadows. I'm not really following a drawing or even um, uh, my motif as I look up the shadows have already moved and cover the door completely. Rather I'm looking at my painting almost a hundred percent of the time and gauging uh, what looks good. I guess that's the simplest way I can put, put it. Uh, what looks good as it develops. Now you can see there's a strong connection already formed in the shadow pattern and my stroke now is changing as I move to describe the lower section of the painting. At the same time this is unifying that shadow pattern and giving me uh, uh, strength through the entire lower section. The lighter colors that were painted in the first stage are shining through and the underpainting itself as you watch the, the the shadows dry a bit you see that that underpainting is coming through as well so this is uh, staying true to my watercolor plan which uh, I described for myself um, before even painting even dipping my brush into the paint I had an idea of uh, the stages and uh, the plan, the general plan of uh, creating a beautiful shadow pattern as well as varying that shadow pattern from top to bottom so that we get a variety of strokes and a variety of intensity in the shadows themselves. I did a bit of splatter there as you notice with a very strong dark pigment. This is representing overhead foliage and uh, at the same time kind of refining or defining that passage of light from above to uh, narrow it down and um, rest on the doorway and the, the first layer of steps. It also gives a feeling that there's a tree overhead casting these shadows or multiple trees overhead casting shadows upon the doorway. Same time uh, I'm using uh, that splatter to help me to keep it, help me to keep these uh, touches feeling random as, as leaves do 
uh, they have that random quality and in truth we're not very good at painting uh, with a sense of randomness we're very good at painting repeated shapes um, measured shapes so that's why I resol um, resolve to use the splatter in other words I'm flicking the, the brush with a brush full of paint on the top part of the painting and watching the splatter land in a sort of unpredictable manner and this I believe represents that material that uh, feeling of leaves overhead to the degree, degree that I want it to and I am joining some of those leaves with strokes and now I'm adding dry brush so the shadows that were painted have dried off I'm returning to sort of restate the structure of that brownstone by describing windows, uh, trims, and decorative elements on the brick. In fact, this is a, really a beautiful part of these brownstones. Each one is a little different. Each one has its own um, design and to walk through these uh, neighborhoods where brownstones are sort of uh, on every block is a real, real joy because you can see how the architects have varied the, uh, the way that building is designed, even though they remain almost the same height. Almost all of them have three or four stories of grand entrances we see here and dormers and uh, bowed windows as we see here, there's still an individual quality to each one. Each one has a little bit different way that they handle the, the entrance or a little different way that they handle the trim around the, the uh, windows. And so for the artist, this is a real opportunity to exaggerate that. When I'm using the dry brush, I can design these... Uh, these passages to reflect the quality of this particular building and at the same time what this is doing is to make the paint the shadows that were just painted feel more transparent so there's activity visual activity in the shadows and that activity is being described very methodically um, onto dry paper and what it's going to do, I believe the final result here will make the, the shadows feel transparent. They'll still feel as though they're dancing over the surface of the building, but we'll feel the surface of the building just a little bit more, plus we'll see some of the windows and moldings that make up this brownstone. Even with this, uh, this defining stroke, uh, defining elements. I'm trying to be calligraphic. I'm trying to be spontaneous and not too rigid, not too descriptive, but allude to the sense of the shape of the window that's underneath, any sort of blind that might be in that window, any sort of particular molding. Um, and as I uh, describe these, I'm cognizant also that I'm trying to support my main focal area. I don't want to get too uh, ambitious in the periphery. Um, and I think you see that quality in the final painting. This is, that painting is finished for the moment and I won't be adding much more to that except for uh, maybe some pavers or uh, additional colors in the garden area Really, the focal point remains this entrance to the building and especially the light striking the upper part of the building and the green door. So everything forward from here is using a, a small brush and working on dry paper uh, with a high degree of detail. Well, I should say a high degree of control. So um, my speed is slowed down quite a bit and I can go about this rather methodically because I'm working on dry paper. And everything added this, at this point is measured against that green door. I'm trying to 
um, add detail, but not so as to detract from uh, the final image. A little more splatter to make that area uh, perhaps connect the darks above a little more. So perhaps the, the sequence is a bit surprising in painting the shadows in the early stage and painting the um, windows, moldings, etc. in the later stage, but this has worked well for me. Here's the finished piece. Um, and it's given me a, a more control where I want control. If the shadows are painted after the fact, I, I've found that it tends to... Um, lose their quality, the, the shadow becomes blurred, as well as the molding that it's falling on. So I've, I've grown accustomed to painting the shadows in the early stage and then working into the shadows after they're dry. So hopefully this has addressed uh, those three points that I wanted to present in the beginning of painting, um, how to paint a complex shadow pattern. Uh, one way that you can make those shadows feel as though they're glowing with the underpainting. And again, how to make those shadows feel transparent by painting into them after they're dry to describe moldings and details and this sort of thing. So you can find uh, my materials list in the description. You can find links to videos that uh, deal with the same sort of problems and solutions as well as a PDF that describes uh, this, this painting in a little more detail.